Welcome to The Lucrative Society. I'm your host, Mindy Kniss. And I'm Sean Stevenson. Enjoy the show. All right, my friends, we have a special treat for you today. Our friend, Nicole Patrice DeMember, is here with us. And I am super excited for this conversation just because she's such a rock star. And I'm, I enjoy hanging out with her, and I'm super jazzed to introduce her to all of our audience. So, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Very excited to catch up. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. One of the ways that we like to begin these episodes is to talk with our guests a little bit about their journey. And you have had such a, an interesting and dynamic and I would say just unique journey as an entrepreneur and as a, as a woman founder and person in business. I mean, there's so many different ways that we could go with this, but if you could just give a brief overview of a bit of your journey to get you to where you are today. Okay. Well, I think a constant theme has been being kicked out of stuff. And of course, with that, you know, being frustrated and then what came next was always better. And still kind of like have to remember that sometimes. But it had a lot of like really unexpected opportunities. Um, I didn't really have a direction or thought in mind. And so it's just been interesting to like kind of that old phrase, like the door closes and a window opens, I think really applies. So like when you look back over it, it seems amazing. But then of course, as always in between, there's these spots where it's like, you felt like the world was going to end. But yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm very thankful for, for all the doors that shut. Can you talk a little bit about some of those? Because anytime somebody kicked out of something, I'm like, well, that's a good story. I'm sure. (laughs) So so one that I think is, a, you know, it, it's kind of a story that up until maybe eight years ago, I really struggled with. And uh, I was kicked out of the same university twice. Um, and interestingly enough, the ever lovely Beth Comstock pointed out to me last summer, she's like, no one gets kicked out of the University of Arizona. She's like, that's really impressive. And, uh, but I had, I had, you know, very clear direction on what I wanted to do going in there. I was going in for political science, taking econ classes and looking at working somewhere in the state department. It was something I had looked into through high school. And so they were very clear with me. They found me to be very difficult. And some of the professors found me to be very difficult and uh, they felt I should find a new program. And uh, I had talked my way back in the second time. And by the end of the next semester, they were like, we are definitely not the program for you. And so I got, you know, up in arms and telling my mom how I'll convince them again to take me back. And thankfully, this lovely woman who birthed me was like, why don't we try something different? And and that led to me, um, you know, working on a whole variety of different things and uh, got, you know, very involved in starting a company pretty early on the Internet in like the mid late 90s. So I was very appreciative of uh, had I finished the university program, I probably would have been quite miserable. Yeah, for sure. Can you talk a little bit about some of your your various companies or what you know, what yeah, yeah. the biggest interests have been along the way? So that was kind of thing. Like I never, so I ended up doing a lot of stuff in music industry. And I always like, it's interesting because I see a lot of people that have tried to get in the music industry and that wasn't my intention. Um, but there was people having some problems. Um, part of it was watching people throw these outdoor rave festivals in Arizona, in Tucson, they were getting busted. And I had been to one of these events uh, with my cousin up in Canada, a a guy, he was using a moniker at the time called Plastic Man. He's Richie Houghton. I'd seen him really understood his structure after talking to people through that and understanding like what they were doing. And and so when I got back to Tucson, friends were getting in trouble and uh, understanding enough about how governments run. It was like, oh, you just need permits. And so we were hiring, started hiring off-duty cops which I knew some from some of my classes and we hired some EMTs we found were important. And we were doing permits under like family reunions and all sorts of different religious type things we could kind of loophole in. And, uh, and then that led into doing a bit of a early social network, very flat, um, a messaging board that waterfalls called raves.com. And then we had a ticketing company, which we started as rave pass to sell tickets online we were seeing Ticketmaster at like, I think $8. At, this is like 97, like $8 a ticket, which I think they're now up to 11. And, and not that Ticketmaster wanted to deal with anyone doing like 
possibly illegal offsite venue um, shows, but, uh, but it took off. Like it, it was really neat to see communities come together and it was really great to see a lot of like just oddballs who have later now are still friends, like 20 some years later and some of the most interesting like coders, human rights activists out there. So, so it was, it was, it was a neat time to be a part of and, uh, and we were all kind of learning on the fly. So. Nicole, I know a little bit about your career history based on what you've shared with me before, but what fascinates me is I feel like you've had multiple lives in this lifetime. Like, the more I get to know you, the more I'm like, is she for real or is this like a character? Or is she like 80 years old? Or that she's (laughs) playing. But I mean, you certainly don't remind me of a white girl. That's just my honest (laughs) opinion here. Um, can you explain to the listener, like, why would I say that? And you know that it's playful tongue in cheek here, but like, what is it about your multiple lives in this lifetime? How have you done that? And what are some of the lives that you would explain here? It, it, it's always kind of still blows me away. Um, I had a chance this week to hear some musicians I've known. And, you know, after getting involved with these raves that are now kind of known as EDC dance party stuff, I ended up getting involved in hip hop. And I got to work with uh, Jay Electronica and Mos Def and Erica Badu and uh, Eminem and like just some really crazy wild poets that aren't just musicians, but I think huge thought leaders. And to be in these rooms in Detroit with people and many times being the only white person in there and just cultivating like really deep rooted friendships and learning so much. But I know it, it's something very, very special to me that I was welcomed into the rooms and I was trusted and uh, dealing with people's recordings and, and, you know, these are like precious gemstones they're creating and how they got released and who got to hear them first and early. And it, it, I'm still very touched by that. So looking back at all the like living legends that you've had the, the pleasure of working with and uh, collaborating on from a business perspective. When the outside world hears these names, I think they have a, probably a lot of assumptions that are incorrect. Um, mm-hmm. Can you talk to like, what have you seen from the incredible geniuses that you've worked with? Um, what are some of the traits that you would notice that would be present in them that maybe not everybody would assume or be aware of? You know, I, I think, and, and, you know, I think we all hear this at times and, you know, it's like one of the kind of gossip mags, maybe people, they're like, they're just like you. And it's like, but they are. And it's like, you know, we're all human. We have this need for oxygen. You know, we need enough blood to survive and we sleep and we eat nutritious, you know, foods, hopefully to survive. And, you know, you see people do these life things. Like I remember at a time M was late to the studio and which, but it was like one time. and. I was like, oh, no, it's fine. You know, whatever. We're used to artists running a little bit late or, or changing schedules. And they're like, oh, no, we just want to make sure you know, like, he's taking Hallie or Haley, his daughter, to a math tutor. Like, she's having a little trouble in math, and he wants to, like, meet the tutor first and make sure this is going to be useful. And you're like, okay, that's, like, the best reason ever to be late. Like, math is important. <laughs> and the fact that, you know, this, like, could be seen as like a very hardcore rapper is, like, picking his daughter up from school and, you know, interviewing math tutors with her. And you're just like okay, that's cool. Like, and, and I think there's a lot of those scenarios that happen that people don't always, you know, see the behind the scenes or, or realize that, you know, everyone's has bad days and good days and gets up and, you know, has those nights you have trouble sleeping. And I don't know. I think it's always just good to put in perspective that it's, you know, just, I don't know. It's nothing, you know, maybe there's a few aliens lurking out there amongst us, but, uh, but at the end of the day, we're all just human. That's a perfect segue into one of the questions that I have for you. So our intention in this podcast and in talking to all the various people is to look at the intersection of happiness and wealth. And specifically for you, because you've had, as you just talked about, all of these different connection points with, with a variety of people where you know a lot of folks probably would have a certain assumption about them. But Also, you live in San Francisco, and I think there is such a perception of wealth and tech and Silicon Valley and all, you know, everything there. I want to talk to you about that wealth and happiness thing, because we think 
you can have both. But a lot of people that we know are either wealthy and miserable or happy and broke. So, so could you touch on that, you know, that dynamic, especially in that San Francisco realm? Yeah, I mean, it's it definitely, I came out to San Francisco 11 years ago. Um, my first time visiting by way was 88 as a family trip. But it, it, I think we've definitely gotten like a pretty, I don't know, just amusing, you know, kind of like, moniker of whether it's you know wearing the puffy vests or you know the scooters or I don't know on and on and on you know I I've definitely in any of the industries I've been in whether it be you know the banking stuff or the music or um, just even within volunteer groups and I see the people who really appreciate what they have whether it be like some super fancy you know sports car or or just having like a close relationship with living family members and I think there's a lot in the attitude which is one thing I really always appreciate with you guys is you know and it it's something that I think sometimes to be reminded to be happy or appreciate what we have or just take that time to recognize it and I've seen that in a difference of you know and, and there's always a thing like someone could be very talented or someone could be you know, born into a lottery of a lot of money, family money stuff, which all of those are going to have its problems with it. And I guess it's like, what side are you going to focus on? And, you know, I, I've been fortunate enough to have a good childhood, but it was, you know, at times a bit meager. So it, it's definitely a reminder to appreciate what we have. And, um, but I've also been able to like make a bunch of money and lose a bunch of money, which are all crazy feelings. And, you know, when you go from high up to low down and then you start going back up again, it definitely takes a few rounds to very much appreciate, like, like I still appreciate the fact that like I can order an Uber car and get, you know, the direct one to get to a meeting and um, that I can go to the grocery store and buy a bunch of food. And these are things that are definitely not lost on me. And I, I feel that, uh, you know, I want to always, I like talking about this because it reminds me to, you know, be aware that I do have these opportunities. So one of the things that I admire about you is uh, what a strong woman you are in business and on this planet and the social issues. What I'm curious about is how are you, how are you seeing the landscape changing in tech and business with women? Do you feel like there are more women, there are not enough women? What's your personal opinion on this? So I, I've definitely said this out loud a lot um, in the last, especially six months, but I think this is an amazing time to be alive. I'm 42, and I feel like I can at least identify and recognize a few generations before me that fought so hard that I could be where I'm at. And seeing and identifying the difference, and even like the last few years, we've had huge breakthroughs. Um, not only here in the United States, but, you know, we're seeing it through a lot of other countries, whether it's women being able to drive or being able to talk openly about having periods, like what we would like to think is very basic is not everywhere. And seeing this change and, and seeing these conversations be more open, but also realizing at times I thought I had it really good. And I look back and I'm like, I was definitely making like a quarter of what everyone else was making, but I didn't know that, nor did I know to like ask for more money. I think I'm getting a much better eye and I hope others are too of like what is available to us and in the rooms that, you know, we do completely deserve to be in. And, and uh, I've, um, I don't know, I think the last few years have been a nice change of pace. What would you recommend to somebody who, especially a young woman today, you know, cause I love what you just said about you. Like you didn't even know to ask. Yeah realize that that's the situation you were in what what recommendation would you have for someone who's younger and might not have the perspective that that we have you know in our in our 40s when they're in their 20s or 30s what would you say to a young lady um i would say that never if you're invited into a room or you can figure out a way to get into the room like never feel like you don't deserve to be there and i know that can be hard and you might have to like repeatedly tell yourself that and talk with others about it but and remember, we've all been there. Like there's been times that it's like, you know, you feel like, wait, what am I doing here? Um, you know, well, people think I'm a fraud. And, and it's like, just sit and listen and take it in. But something I found useful that was recommended to me was, you know, listen, especially if it's a speaker, like very diligently and do your research prior on them so you're educated. And then think through and try to come up with a smart question. And like, don't 
hold the floor. Don't over talk about it or make statements. Ask, you know, a question, you know, get them and get into a conversation with them. And, and I think we can all be drawn in when uh, someone starts bringing up things that we're interested to talk about. But I also think too, not being afraid, like I, I don't have the best vocabulary and I consistently am in rooms with people who have some wild, crazy Harvard like vocabulary. And I have to consistently ask like, what does that word mean? And, you know, and, and I would get frustrated when I first would do this and people would be like, I can't believe you don't know this word. Or they would laugh at me. And I was just like, no, that's why I'm asking you. Like, I don't know what this word is. And it, it's taken a while to like, and I still every once in a while catch someone like almost kind of like making fun and it's like that's not cool dude like I just want to know what this word means but I I think it's uh I don't know I I think showing up too is really important and taking the time to like take care of yourself and then be there don't feel you know I guess like don't be too frazzled I was actually talking with someone about this today we were talking about how to get a mentor and I need to look into this further but I had caught um Cheryl over from Facebook had said something to the effect of And I think there's truth to it. And I don't understand yet how to express it. So if you don't mind, I'll give it a go here. But the idea of like, it's one thing to go up to someone and be like, hey, will you be my mentor? It's another thing to like back to like do some research, find some questions, reach out to them, whether it's through Twitter or email, get someone to introduce you, you know, find them at a conference, you know, and start to start the conversation and say, hey, can I follow up with you as I look further into this? And I've been practicing more on that way. And there's loads of people I'd love to have more regular conversations with. And, and I took her advice on that. And some of these people, like it kind of dead ends. And some people were like, you know, a year into having a pretty regular conversation. And uh, I think finding those mentors that are gonna, you know, benefit you and and trying to find like a nice mutual, um, I guess, growth of friendship with it. Yeah, so you mentioned enjoying talking about the things that interest you and one of the segments that we love to talk about with our guests is curiosity so i will ask you what are some of the things that you are curious about and maybe if you can list three to five because i'm always fascinated by we even think we know some of our guests pretty well and then they'll say something and we're like really like you're interested in that that's awesome but we just didn't know so it's such an interesting question what are you curious about So this is amazing because earlier today I was doing some research and I'm like, I wonder if I'll be able to talk about it with them. (laughs) So one of the things today I've spent trying to figure out how to do is how to make flower crowns. I'm going to a wonderful friend's home tomorrow for like a summer solstice event, like gathering. And I was like, what can I do? And I was like, I'm in Seattle. I'm going to go to the flower markets and figure out how to make flower crowns. So I've been like on YouTube and reading people's blogs about this. And, uh, and so that's kind of something that's just kind of fun. And it was just felt kind of like just kind of a cutesy like thing to like prepare for the weekend to share with friends, but something maybe a little more deeper and, and longer term I've looked into for a while is a lot based on watching many of the Captain Janeway Voyager episodes of, uh, Star Trek was figuring out in the last few years, like, how does this become a possibility and a reality? And, and, uh, talking with people over at SpaceX and and especially seeing their growth the last five years, um, you see like, when are we going to have something that can house about, what is it, 30 to maybe a hundred people and and go deep space, like past Mars, pass out of the solar system with most likely, you know, idea that anyone on it isn't coming back. We we don't know if we'll be able to get them back. And uh, and what does that mean and what's out there and, and who goes and why do they go? And, you know, are they willing to, you know, commit to this like, possible rare earth live fu- funeral for themselves before leaving and, and how does their families feel and, and so I quite enjoy talking about that with people and seeing who's even open to it like I know Bartoon de Thurston um, is definitely into it and he's open to the idea of it but we've learned some of our other friends as we've talked to them are a very hard no about it and so yeah, I don't know I think that and kind of trying to understand I like to travel and I like to figure out like from Seattle here, I want to get, I found I could take the Amtrak train to Montana to go to Glacier National Park, never been. And uh, so just kind of figuring out like, how can I get on these little mini adventures? And I like that. I like kind of seeing new places and uh, definitely like being in the mountains. Love it. So Nicole, there's a segment that we do. I'm hoping you enjoy as much as we do. 
and we call it the herb method, H-E-R-B. And, you know, share as much or as little that comes to you. I'm going to give you each letter to prompt uh, your response. So the H stands for habit. What are some of the habits that you have that have created your businesses and your overall well-being? Okay. I think something that at times I was heard was bad um, and now I've realized where it's good and stubborn and like having this habit of not giving up and not relenting. And, you know, that doesn't always work if it's it's something um, that's not helping. Like I definitely have a bit of a sugar habit and have to, you know, really check myself on that. But, but keep showing up. Like you get knocked down, people tell you no, like, and you just keep at it and finding something once I'm asphyxiated on it is it is it's like you have to keep pushing and keep pushing and uh, I think it's really easy to stop or make excuses or give up and at times I think it's okay because it's clearly not the interest you have but when you have that opportunity to just keep pushing on something it, it's it's super magical so the E stands for environment how do you keep your home your office your vehicle whatever it may be and like what do you keep in and what do you keep out of your environment to better yourself and your businesses? Well, this is straight from my father, who's a lovely man. He was always like organized office, room, desk, whatever, organized mind. And of course, I fought him very hard on that because I thought my messy space was very lovely. And now I'm, I'm very, very good about that. And, and I do find to wake up, to come home, to sit at my desk any of these things, I feel better. And I just, it just just doesn't weigh on me. And so I I do think to have some order, I do keep some tchotchkes around and trinkets that remind me of family and friends. But I I try to keep a fairly clean space. Um, It's just objects around, but I also like to keep everything very, very clean, you know, dust-free, wiped down, stuff like that, folded, uh, tucked away. Before you move on to R, I have to ask you, did you read the book called Messy? No, it's fantastic. I loved it because I, I keep it justified my, her behavior. <laughs> I keep my desk in a little bit of a mess. And this book was brilliant about the, the connection points with being a little bit messy and yeah. creativity. So mm. I, well, think I think at times, I mean, I've definitely had times where I'm like going through stuff. I keep all my notebooks. Um, I do a lot of like, I'll roll out huge things, usually of wrapping paper like the real white shiny kind or that's white on the back and I'll write with markers on it and do that over dry erase boards because I can wrap them up and keep them so there is times like the walls are covered there's stuff everywhere note cards and I know where everything is so anyone to walk in is most likely overwhelmed but it's like my whole brain is all over the room and I, I do like that scenario where I can spend a few days re-going through stuff so from the E we're going to move to the R which is resources. And this can include books, courses, audios, uh, coaching, whatever it may be. What are some of the resources that have developed you as a leader, as a uh, entrepreneur, and just in your own personal life? Oh, yeah. I I think one I'm going to give a shout out to is public libraries. Uh, I really feel many times they're overlooked. I encourage everyone listening to this right now, please go out and get a library card. Um, Most areas now have eBooks you can get. So you don't even have to step foot in the library, but there's just loads of interesting magazines. But my ultimate favorite gem that some libraries aren't carrying anymore, but most city libraries will have is microfiche. And I have the ability to usually out Google information and run to the bottom of it. And so I usually find if I can get into whether it's San Francisco city library, right by our city hall, I can pull up so much more information through the microfiche. And uh, it's just kind of a fun system that I think people might not know of if they're not of a certain age or might seem a little outdated, but it's still in use. And you can actually pull up a lot of interesting stuff like from decades ago. Nicole, also, yeah. you pretty much just elevated yourself to like the coolest person in my brain right now because I like yes to everything you just said. <laughs> I love that. For the millennials listening, microfish uh, (laughs) is something that you needed rocks and sticks to get moving to make fun. No, so (laughs) basically it was like a film strip on crack where you could whip through articles and uh, what would you say, periodic? It was like scans of newspapers. Yeah. Yeah. And 
uh, yeah, I spent many a day in the library with the microfiche. So moving to Great, I'm glad we're all in the microfiche club here. I'm very yeah, excited about yeah. this. So next up, we're going to talk about the Dewey Decimal System. No. So then we're going to move on to the B, which is beliefs. What are some core beliefs that you have about humanity, that you have about yourself, that you have about money, success? Just share as many beliefs that bubble up in this moment as you can that have really defined you. Okay. Um, well, I was very lucky. Um, my parents, my mom, Marguerite, always said over and over and over again, anything is possible. Like just that one phrase. And to repeat that and hear that all the time really helped. And then my dad was really good about what's the worst that can happen? And he, they just really sent us off into the world with that mentality. And I, I think my brother and I really showed that. Um, also, uh, I once worked for this gentleman who I know can be a bit controversial, Peter Thiel, but you know, he had a byline in his foundation, I think it's still on the website, that no human should live in fear. I think that's just a really nice, simple way to put it. And that obviously applies to a lot of things, but I don't know. And then I had a nun for an aunt. That's what my name, middle, my middle name Patrice is from, Sister Pat. And she always just encouraged me to be a good person and really think through what that means. And I don't know, I, I've really gotten better understanding, I think in the last like 10 years of the idea of we're living in an abundance. I mean, I, I know that doesn't maybe apply for everyone, but, but getting in more to an abundance mentality and, and really thinking through what that means. And just knowing like, we can always like find another seat at the table or there's enough food or, you know, we'll, we'll figure out like if we need to like help someone out with something, you know, it, it's really possible, I think. And too many times I have to admit prior to that, through my twenties, I was really living in a scarcity mentality at times and, and all it did was stress me out. So I definitely believe that uh, really identifying that and getting away from that has helped me a lot. So that's, that's awesome. So I want to go back to happiness and being a woman in the industries that you've been a part of. And, and as you mentioned earlier, being kicked out of a variety of different things. I want to talk about happiness in hardship or maybe not hardship. I don't know if that's the right word, but in conflict or situations. And I know that you're really big on women and helping that elevate the status of women and to me, there's a lot of frustration there. There's a lot of anger in that. And yet I don't see you as an angry person. You know, I, I, that doesn't resonate in terms of how I think of you. So I want to use that, that kind of guiding aspect of happiness, but then looking at maybe some of the harder conflict parts of your life and, and just talk a little bit about that dynamic. It's interesting. It's come up gosh, this was maybe a year ago, a gentleman named David Savage, who I think is becoming very well known as an empath. And we were having a conversation and he's like, I see this side of you that you want to show up and you enjoy working and you want to really do stuff. He's like, and then there's this other side of you that, um, oh gosh, I forgot that side. I'll have to think about it. But he's like, but there's all this, this teeny little angry woman in this back room that you're trying to shut out. And he's like, and it's okay. Like, it's okay to express your anger and frustration. And you know, use this as a fuel and, and use it towards good. And um, I think there is, and I'm still trying to understand that because some people that may listen to this that know me will have definitely seen a temper side of me. And it's something I've had to like understand how to work with and use. But also that's helped me in the last year think through. I don't need to shut it out. And, you know, and, and we've, I think all heard some of the most horrific stories in the last few years, whether it be about, you know, rape or human trafficking or mental and physical abuse. And I, I think that I'm always fascinated to meet someone who's been through what seems to be some of the worst stuff ever. And they are clearly forgiving and they are clearly like, you know, working towards themselves, but they're choosing to live this very happy life. And I'm just talking like people who've been in prison for 10 years and like terrible gnarly prisons. And I, I just, I'm so blown away um, by them. And I find that if I'm feeling, oh, whether it's a bit of poor me or, or I'm kind of down on the dumps, I, I think of these people and I was like, wow, like I have an opportunity to, you know, identify and process with why am I feeling like this and, and how can I move past it? And, you know, I think it could be a lifelong work in progress, but definitely in the last year, I've spent a lot more time on it. Awesome. Nicole, if somebody wants to learn more about you, or wants to have some kind of interaction with you or some of the projects you're working on, where do you want to send them? 
I think that uh, I like Twitter. Um, I, I use it pretty regularly. Um, a lot of times it's just me rambling about nonsense, but I always answer people and my, um, my DMs are open there. And then uh, I, I think like, I don't know, there's different stuff on the internet. In general, I like social media. I've actually tried and have left it open my Instagram for probably like five months. I was a little nervous. I don't know if that was a good idea, but I've actually have really enjoyed like meeting new random people and, and, uh, and, you know, we get to kind of see little vignettes and insights to each other's life. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I like, if you ever run into me in public, come up and say hi, please. Like I, you know, we'll socialize and hang out at different events and music concerts and stuff. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm open. Like I, I find people to be very lovely and interesting and it's always nice to explore and meet new humans out there. Sure. Well, you just sparked a, a closing question that I wasn't even thinking to ask, but of all the people you met in your career and your life and your travels and everything, who were like one or two people that you were like, holy cow, like I learned so much or I was so moved, like somebody that really just uh, made an awesome impression on your soul. Well, one, um, you know, also, and he's since passed, but uh, is uh, Richard Nichols. And uh, I remember we were together in his suite on a boat. Um, he is, was the manager of the Roots. He had discovered them and worked with them through so many amazing things. And, you know, a couple of years ago he passed and everyone I know still thinks so fondly of him, but he really looked out for me. He really changed my perspective on a lot of ways I was looking at the world just, I don't know. And he, he always was like very encouraging of myself and so many others I know to just give us that, like, you can do anything, like get out there. You've got this. I know he's very missed, but, uh, but I am very thankful that I got that time with him. So. That's awesome. And tell us again, your Twitter handle. Oh, it's N P D member. So N P D are my initials. The members, my last name, D member is like remember, but a D instead of an R and that's my handle for all social media. Perfect. Nicole, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom, your energy, your love with us. We know that we are better people having you in our lives, and we are so grateful that you spent some time with us today. Oh, I'm just so honored. I quite always enjoy the two of you. You have such a magic together and separate. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening. Make sure and subscribe to The Lucrative Society on iTunes and leave a review of the podcast. For more information on our programs, visit our website at lucra.com. That's L-U-C-R-A dot com.